Hey, it's Dr. Centeno, and I'm going to talk today uh, about mesenchymal stem cell differentiation versus paracrine. Now, this is a talk I gave at the IOF 2020, and I'm uh, recording it so everyone can see this talk because it's it's got some pretty important information. So uh, with mesenchymal stem cells and really all stem cells, there's this question as to whether or not they they repair things or work in the body, either through differentiation, which is where they turn into another cell type that's required, and then they repair that and engraft into the site, or paracrine, where they only excrete cytokines, growth factors, and other things like exosomes that coordinate a repair response by other cells. And this is how this talk usually goes. Uh, mesenchymal stem cells in vitro differentiate. However, in vivo, they can't be found in lesions past about a month. Hence, they must act by paracrine means and don't really differentiate. Uh, so they differentiate in the lab, but since we can't find them uh, in real animals after we inject them, then they must be acting through this chemical means uh, and then just kind of disappearing. But I'm not giving that lecture because there's a problem with that lecture. And the problem is that it's not really all that accurate if you look at the data. Uh, so what we're gonna discuss, we'll talk about rat bummer aspiration, uh, allogeneic stem cell studies, autologous stem cell studies, and the fact that we have an entire drug industry gearing up to make allogeneic mesenchymal stem cells uh, that is really producing pretty poor results in their clinical trials, and there's a reason why. So the MSC literature has a very serious rat autologous research problem, meaning it's very tough to get clinically meaningful numbers of MSCs from a single rat without also killing that rat. So if you want to use one rat stem cells in the same rat, the problem is getting those stem cells will kill the rat. And there's a reason why. If you look at the size of the needle versus the size of the bones here, this is epic. Uh, meaning you can only use a needle that's so small and still have bone marrow aspirate flow through it. So you can see here that these needles are as big as the pelvis or as big as the long bones. So you're not going to really be able to get stem, cell, stem cells out of a single rat uh, without also killing that rat or maiming that rat. Now in humans, we use a very tiny little apparatus uh, called a trocar to take bone marrow aspirate from, the, from a big pelvis. But in rats, as you can see, that's not the case. Hence, all of the rat research we have is a pooled donor model. And I'm gonna show you that that's a big problem for these FDA approved cell drugs winding their way through the FDA approval process right now, because they don't use pooled donor models, they use a single donor. So here's what this looks like. We end up killing lots of rats and pooling all of their cells uh, and then isolating and growing those cells and then injecting all of those different cells into a single animal, and that's called a pooled stem cell model. But I'm going to show you that I believe this explains the spotty uh, mesenchymal stem cell clinical trial results that we see in the literature. Uh, and that is we have a subpopulation of patients that respond but we don't generally see a replication of the really great results that we see in animal models. So let's explore that a bit more. So there was this fiction a while back that mesenchymal stem cells were immune privileged. They are not, uh, they're immunoevasive. Now the difference would be immune privilege would mean that you could use someone else's stem cells uh, in another patient, and that would be fine long-term. Uh, the problem is that isn't fine long-term. Eventually, uh, the person you put them in uh, will recognize that they're foreign and take them out. So they can evade the immune system for a while, 
but they can't uh, suppress the immune system for long periods of time. Eventually they get recognized as foreign tissue. And this goes really to the heart of our story. So allogeneic MSCs, let's take a look at some of that research. So we know, and, and pretty much all of the allogeneic, meaning someone else's stem cell studies in animals, tend to go something like this. The stem cells are found in the cartilage lesion at month one, but there's not that many left at month two and month six. Um, so meaning they're getting taken out. And again, that's how this story got started, that these things must then uh, work through paracrine means. Um, and they're not working through differentiation. I mean, you can't find them in the lesion long term. Now, this is some really interesting research here by Ashley Watts of Texas A&M. This is a horse model, and what she found was that there was a problem with what's called the HLA match of the stem cells she was using. When she was using autologous cells, things worked very well. But she, when she went to allogeneic, meaning another horse's stem cells, they didn't work as well. In fact, she found they worked out better. The results were better if there was a closer match between the stem cell that she was putting in and the horse versus not a close match. Meaning a more closely HLA matched donor and recipient resulted in MSCs that stuck around and acted. Uh, also, again, the outcomes were based on a random match or mismatch. So if she randomly had a good match between the cells and the horse, things went well. And realize this whole HLA matching thing has been done for many years in umbilical cord uh, stem cell trials uh, when they're used for cancer. You have to have a close match to the patient. And this match is based on the surface receptors of these cells. Now, in a pooled animal model like we talked about before, there's a really good chance you're going to have a random match, right? You got all these different mices up here and their different colors represent the fact that they have different uh, HLA types or subtypes. But you're going to probably have uh, this mouse here who is matched to that mouse there. So you're going to have some cell cells that are matched pretty good. So you're going to probably see better results because you have a higher chance of a random match between all of your pooled mouse cells and the mouse that you're treating. Now let's look at autologous MSCs. And what's interesting is that there's, it's really hard to find tracking studies on autologous MSCs. We just don't have that much out there. It's interesting uh, that this hasn't been done more, but I was able to find some. So you can track mesenchymal stem cells and animals, you can use a fluorescent stain. The problem there is you have to kill the animal to see the stain, so that doesn't work in human trials. Uh, now for human trials, you can use an iron nanoparticle that can be seen on MRI, and that's just starting to be dialed in. When I first started to look at this stuff, or if you were using these particles, it literally took overnight to get the MRI image. So that, obviously that doesn't work in real patients. Nowadays, it's a bit better. So you can really start to track this stuff, but only from a research standpoint. So here's an interesting study that showed that in a human model, bone marrow concentrate injected into the discs, not only stuck around, but differentiated into chondrocytes in human discs. Uh, now, that's not supposed to happen based on the Arne Kaplan model of medicinal signaling cells, that these cells get taken out and they're only peregrine. They're not supposed to differentiate like this in vivo in real patients, but these did. Here's another autologous study in equines or horses. And again, uh, these cells aren't supposed to stay around for more than four weeks, but at nine weeks when they ended the experiment, these autologous cells were still there in high numbers, meaning they're sticking around. Uh, this is tracheal engraftment of autologous MSCs in rabbits. And again, they stuck around. Why? Because a rabbit is big enough to take bone marrow out of and culture expand those cells and put it back in the rabbit without killing the rabbit. 
So why is all this important in the differentiation versus paracrine debate? Uh, well, do you see a trend? Autologous MSCs and graft and stick around. Uh, and then they differentiate in vivo. And allogeneic MSCs get taken out by the host immune system and don't stick around long. So based on the existing literature, the allocell mechanism of action is paracrine, as has been discussed, the whole medicinal signaling cell thing, while the autologous MOA is likely both. So the differences are that auto is stay and play or autologous, and allo, allogeneic, is hit and run. So how does that impact therapy? Autologous therapies could be better for long-term repair of tissues like cartilage, tendon, etc. And allotherapies may work well for short-term immune suppression and repair. Now, this is not what the companies producing allo stem cells for mass production and distribution want to hear, but it seems to be where this literature has been heading for some time. I've been tracking this particular literature going back now about six or seven years. So in summary, uh, the literature has a rat bone marrow problem. A pulled allogeneic MSC model doesn't translate well into human clinical trials. The allo MSCs that you're using need to be donor matched and expect allo MSC products to continue to produce hit and miss results depending on how close those matches are between the cells and the recipient. Uh, which is not a good thing for that industry. So thanks so much for watching and have a great day.